In this episode, what were the laws of the ancient nomads and what followed their violation? In world history, there have been states whose inhabitants were considered particularly prone to lawlessness and barbarism. In the old days, nomadic tribes were also considered as such. There was a belief that they live in a wild, reckless, and powerless world. However, the nomadic society had its own strict laws, which were adhered not only to the steppe inhabitants, but also to visiting travelers. It was a series of rules that formed the basis for creating even the worst constitution of Kazakhstan. But how and who first developed legislation in a nomadic society? By what laws did the Kazakhs live? And by what laws were they judged? How it all began. In its full form, it is a system. Jassy of Kangis Khan, this is the beginning of the 13th century. All rise, the court is in session. Of course, it did not have such names as now the prosecutor, the lawyer, but these were legal representatives of the parties to the process. Crimes and punishment were similar. It was castrated respectably. Watch all this right now. Modern society lives according to the laws that the state sets. Their absence will lead to inevitable chaos. Therefore, a huge number of people stand guard over our peace of mind, ranging from law enforcement agencies who, in fact, catch the criminals and ending with the judges who pass various sentences on them. But how was the justice done in antiquity? My name is Andrei Slozhin. It is the Time Puzzle. According to historians, the, the first set of rules or laws appeared on the territory of modern Iraq in the 19th century BC. This code of laws is known to the world under the name Laws of Eshnunna, after the name of the king who introduced them. The legislation consisted of 61 articles. The basic rules in them concerned commodity, money relations, and slave holding. Later, a code of laws was introduced in Babylon in 1750 BC, and then the Romans also introduced the law in 450 BC. And when did they start using legal relations in Kazakhstan? We addressed this question to the Chokan Valikanov Institute of History and Ethnology, and the historian Bolat Smagulov tried to answer. <laughs> For example, in the era of the Huns and so on, it is known to us from fragmentary information, but in its full form, this is a system, Genghis Khan's foundations. This is the beginning of the 13th century, which suggested that there were certain norms for mutual assistance to fellow tribesmen. The word Yasa can be translated as the law of the great power. According to legend, it was composed by Genghis Khan himself at the Old Mongolian Kurultai. Unfortunately, the original set of rules did not reach us, and historians restored it from the records of Persian and Arab travelers. It was studied in detail by an Austrian orientalist and researcher, Joseph Baron von Hammer Porkstall. According to the data, Porkstall managed to find out that Yasa was divided into five sections. Crimes punishable by death, war and military organization, family, meritorious valor and various other prohibitions and rules of behavior of the Mongols in society. It was said that if the Mongol meets another in the steppe, he is obliged, it wasn't optional, he is obliged to offer him to drink and eat. If he refuses to do so, if he does not do it, and this becomes known, then punishment was foreseen for that. In particular, if it was a commoner, then his head was cut off. If this man was of noble birth, then his head was not cut off, his spine was broken. Moreover, the spine was broken so that the blood remained in the body. According to nomadic beliefs, it was believed that human life ends only when blood flows to the ground. Here in this case, if it was a commoner, then blood flew out. 
and in this case, this person cannot be reborn to a new life. The structure of this legal system and its postulates extended not only to the inhabitants of the empire, they also judged those who were guests or opponents in military conflicts. It is the case of brutal resistance besieged. If the city completely and immediately capitulated, they would name their governor in the city. However, as in any business, there were also exceptions. If the enemy killed the Mongolian ambassadors, then punishment was inevitable for him. History knows many such cases. A clear example is the city of Otrar. Another example is the murder of the Mongolian ambassadors by the Russian Polovtsian army. Such a situation happened, for example, in 1223 in the event of a battle at Kalka. It is from the history of relations between the Great Steppe and ancient Russia. There, as we remember, then in the Battle of Kalka, the Russo-Polovtsian army collided on the one hand and on the other hand, the Mongolian army. And then the Russian Polovtsian army, the Russians, uh, were asked to surrender, but they surrendered. They were told that they would not shed blood. But what did Mongols do? They simply laid the captives on the ground, made wooden decking on them and began feasting on them. Naturally, these captives were killed, but blood indeed was not spilled. That is, in other words, according to Mongolian beliefs, the prisoners were given the opportunity to be reborn to a new life. From the point of view of the Yasa set of rules, such a massacre was not a crime. The Mongols fulfilled their obligations, which means there was nothing to judge them for. Yasa has long been a universal code of laws throughout the Mongol Empire until its collapse. But on the territory where the Kazakh tribes lived, there existed its own, no less ancient set of rules, Adat. Anwar Juman, a lawyer who is well aware of not only modern laws, but also the history of law, tells us about this. If we say that it was before the 17th, 18th century, then of course people were judged by Adat because there were, of course, their legal acts, which were adopted by the local Khans, but they did not have such scale and distribution. Adat is the customary law of the Kazakhs, that is, these are the traditions, legal customs, which for a long time regulated our life. Adat is more like a custom, like a tradition that exists in a society that fundamentally everyone obeys. Adat regulated family relations, the so-called family code, the right to property, the right to own one or another pasture. In addition, according to the Adat, relations were built between neighboring owls. Adat was distributed not only in Kazakhstan. According to similar rules, almost all Turkic-speaking peoples lived until the arrival of Islam. So it is known for certain that similar laws were among the peoples of the Vainakh group, Chechens, Dagestanis, Ingushs. However, as historians note, in Kazakhstan and other nations, Adat was not strictly regulated. Disputes were resolved according to the established tradition in closed groups. For example, there could be a different punishment for one crime in different owls. Gradually, Kazakh society, despite the fact that it was nomadic, it realized that rules are needed. We need rules not only that exist between you and us, oral, but also written rules are needed, which can be referred to in case of anything, even when you make a deal. Accordingly, the more complex social relations become, the stronger is the need for the law to appear. The first attempts to create a single law for the Kazakh society were made during the time of the Mongols. This is what one of Kazakhstan's historical internet portals writes about. One of the founders of the judicial legal codes of the Kazakh Khanate was Mikey B, a diplomat and public figure, advisor to Genghis Khan. At one time, Abai Kunanbaev counted Mikey B among the 12 Kazakh Bs who went to congratulate Genghis Khan in 1206 when he became the ruler of Mongolia. 
According to Mikey B, state associations should be governed according to national traditions and customs because even in long-forgotten traditions, there is a certain meaning. После монгольской эпохи в образовании, в период образования Казахского ханства, это, скажем, in the post-Mongol era, during the formation of the Kazakhanate, it was about the middle of the 15th century, these legislative acts began to be improved and others were adopted. Here in the era of Khan Qasim, there is one Qasim Khan Kaskajoli. This is the beaten path of Qasim Khan Khan Qasim. And then later, such a code was adopted by Khan Tauke Jati Jargi which means seven institutions that regulated various systems of punishment. According to some historians, uh, the law set of Jeti Jargi was introduced for the first time at the end of the 17th century by Khan Tau on the old Kazakh May Kurultai on Mount Martobe, which is located in the current Turkestan region. It can be considered the first official code of general Kazakh law. In modern terms, the new set of rules contained the norms of criminal, civil, and administrative law. It also contained provisions on taxes, religious beliefs, and other aspects of life of Kazakh society. Jati Jargi included several main sections, Lane Law, or Zherdawi. Thanks to it, disputes over pastures and watering holes were resolved. Family Law. Here, the main provisions on the conclusion and dissolution of marriages, as well as the property rights of family members, were described. The law on military service spelled out how to form units, how elections of military leaders should be held, as well as punishment in case of war crimes, including treason. In any case, treason was punishable by death. But the only thing is that if you are in battle, you are captured and you, let's say, suppose I'm a Khan and you killed my son in the battle, there was a rule that they did not judge for bravery in battle. That is, I cannot deal with you just because you were more agile or you were more skillful than my son. The fourth point was to clarify how the trial should proceed. The fifth point, historians consider the equivalent of the criminal code. The types of punishment for domestic crimes other than murder were spelled out there. For the killers, there was a separate set of rules. The final seventh point was the law on widows, Jesser Dawi. It indicated the property and personal rights of widows and orphans, as well as the obligations towards them of the community and the relatives of the deceased. Jati Jargi, if to speak in the most general terms, this is probably a prototype of the constitution of Kazakhstan. In fact, Jati Jargi is a set of laws that govern public relations in Kazakhstan. That is, the law to which everyone who was in the territory of the Kazakhanate submitted. But it is impossible to compare Adat and Jati Jargi as something equal, because Jati Jargi are a more formalized, more formal law, normative act. Sooner or later, any state comes to the conclusion that they need such rules of life and behavior in society. The rulers of ancient Egypt, Rome, Greece and states in the East faced this. And the rulers of these countries understood that any innovation can lead to misunderstanding and in some cases to conflict situations among the population. Therefore, when creating the norms of law in Greece, Rome, Egypt and Kazakhstan, similar tools, customs and religion were used. There were actually two sources. The first is Adat, which is logical because people lived for centuries and accordingly those rules had to be taken from somewhere. The second is from the Sharia rules because by that time Islam was already actively spreading in the territory of Kazakhstan. Arab legal tradition, it was much deeper and much more detailed than it was in Kazakhstan. Accordingly, they took some information from that source, including some legal acts. But in general, Kazakhstan, unlike, for example, Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, which was quite a large empire, they tried not to completely copy the Muslim ride. They tried to create some kind of synthesis with national prerequisites. So the introduction of new laws is a difficult process. 
Any state at all times had faced such problems. Somewhere this process took place quickly. In some countries it was delayed. Much depended on the size of the state. Kazakhstan is not France, not Germany, where there is a large concentration of people in cities. This is a step. Moreover, there were no state borders as such, and this territory included modern Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan. Of course, the process of introducing this Jati Jargi took a long time, because it was necessary to convey the idea that there are written rules. These written rules must be respected to all the tribes, to all peoples. Coming up next, who and how developed the first official code of laws for the Kazakhs? Law is a complex science. In order to become a specialist, you need to study more than one year. In addition, a competent lawyer must know, understand, and most importantly, use the laws correctly. And I'm not talking about their creation. So, who then came up with the Jeti Jargi? They called the most wise people. This is Talibi, Aitkabi, Kazbekbi, who helped Tauke Khan to make his legislation. But it is important to note that. How are we used to portray three bees? Such white aged men who have gray hair in their forehead, long beards. In fact, this is a little wrong. Because at the same time of the creation of Jeti Jargi, Tolibi and Kazbek B were probably between 25 and 30 years old. What does it show? This shows that the society judged not by how old you were, but by what reputation you had. If you have already managed to establish yourself as a wise person, then accordingly, you could be invited to the development of universal legislation. They, in fact, were pioneers. Of course, they had assistance. The scribes also took part in all this. Without this, it would be impossible. But these three people were the main leaders of the entire regulatory framework of Kazakhstan. Tolibi, Kazbekbi, and Aitkebi enjoyed enormous prestige among the people. In addition to judicial proceedings, Tauke Khan entrusted them with management activities, including in military affairs. Having started to act, the bees received even greater support among the nomads. The high authority gained earlier was undeniable. They began to be called Atakti Ushbi, three magnificent bees. Many historians say that such an appointment made by Tao Ke Khan was a deliberate strategic decision. After all, people often did not trust the Khans, and three magnificent bees did not cause doubts of their justice. The historian Radek Temergaliev also speaks about this. We are used to thinking of them like there were always three of them, inseparably. In fact, if there were such meetings in life, they were very short-lived. But really, they were very great, legendary personalities. Aitke B, who died earlier than others. We have not much information about him in written sources. Nevertheless, he had enormous prestige. <laughs> Kazbek B, Tole B are the people who, whose authority probably exceeded the authority of many Khans, who lived and ruled at that time. The personality of the bee among the nomads had unshakable authority. Bee is always an absolutely honest and fair person who is not interested in the outcome of the case in one's direction. Of course, there were those who were unclean, but the rumor about such judges quickly spread over the steppe and people stopped contacting them. Shakan Valikhanov has such a work, The Court of the Ancient Bees in Modern Forms. He just describes exactly that the people of famous purity could become bees so that they would not be noticed in some unfavorable deeds. At the same time, if he allowed any actions that discredited him, he would lose everything immediately. Anyone stopped addressing him. He stopped being claimed as a bee and he stopped being a judge. If such cases occurred, the person practically lost everything. In some cases, he was even banished from the village. The shame was so great that often he, the relatives simply rejected the wicked and almost excluded him, even from the Shejire, genealogical ancestry. What is B? 
This is the arbitrator. This is a man whom no one appoints, no one chooses. This is the arbitrator who, if we are suing, if there is a dispute between us, we simply choose the person we trust with you. Whom both of us trust, you and me. And we undertake to obey his decision. We appeal to him. This person makes a fair decision, earns authority and some points. More people address him. And so he becomes from a simple to an authoritative person in his village. He becomes first the most authoritative in his family, the most authoritative in his tribe. Or like Kazbek B or like Toli B at the national level, at the ethnic level, his authority is already recognized and people address him for proceedings. The more authoritative the bee was, the more people came to him, respectively. Many travelers and researchers wrote in their writings about such courts. They characterized the nomadic judicial system at the highest level. For example, the Russian traveler orientalist Vasily Grigoryev spoke about the courts. A man who for six years headed the post of chief censor of the Russian Empire. We see among the nomads such an excellent legal procedure and such arrangements of the investigative and judicial process as many long civilized nations can envy. In addition to serious criminal or administrative cases, bees had to be considered of issues that were considered even funny at that time. One such case occurred with Kazbek B. There was a moment when, for example, two Chinggisids quarreled among themselves for Turkestan. Each considered the city his own, patrimony, his possession. It threatened to turn into such a serious conflict. And at that moment, a Kazbek B intervened, held a court hearing, judged these two Chinggisids, divided the city between them in half. He appointed one to leave and enter Turkestan only through this gate, and the other only through that gate, so that they would never even collide with each other. So was it. There was a similar case in the practice of Tolebi. Two people argued over a little camel. Tolebi ordered them to bring two camels, potential mothers, and the young camel itself should be tied up so that it cries mournfully. A real mother came out to these cries for help. Thus, the dispute was resolved in favor of the owner. This trick is not new in the history of dispute resolution. Recall, for example, the famous King Solomon, who in a similar way resolved a dispute between two mothers about a child. He ordered to divide the baby into two parts and each will get half. Then the real mother, of course, was horrified of that and gave way to the argument, saying that the child was not hers. King Solomon understood everything and returned the baby to the real mother. Almost everyone knows the stories about wise Solomon, but few people are aware that Kazbek B dealt with an identical case. This dispute has the name Bala Dawi, the dispute about the child. Such legends give us a general picture of the image that Kazbek B, Tola B, and Aitka B had among the nomads. Coming up next, crime and punishment. Any legal system implies prisons or dungeons. According to historical data, the first prison appeared in ancient Rome. Its invention is attributed to the Roman ruler Servius Tullius, who lived in 578 to 535 BC. It was an underground prison, Tullianum, or as it is called in other sources, the Mamertine prison. It contained state criminals, captured enemies, and a huge number of Christians. In the dungeons, they waited for punishment, a shameful procession through the streets of the city, after which they were hung up or starved to death. In the Middle Ages, there were prisons in England, France, and other European countries. As a rule, people did not leave such prisons. If a person got there, then he would meet his death in these dungeons. In the steppe, there were no prisons. 
Therefore, some people argue that a nomadic state does not have the features that are inherent in Europe. In this case, it was given to the mercy of the one who was offended. However, the lack of presence was compensated by various other penalties. Everything depended on the severity of the crime. Conventionally, the types of reckoning for the deed can be divided into three types. The death penalty, payment of fines, and alternative punishment. Serious crimes such as murder or rape of a girl, these were considered as serious crimes. Let's say the work, The Path of Abai. There is a situation that was associated with the execution of a certain Kodar, who was suspected of some impermissible connection with the daughter-in-law. Here it is described as, well, naturally he was a writer, but he described it by using ethnographic materials. The way of execution itself was like, the camel rises, and these people, they are from two sides, and in fact they were strangled. There were several kinds of death penalty. For blasphemy, for example, people were stoned. There was another kind of retribution for diverging religious views. It is described by the Russian historian and ethnographer Alexei Levshin. This is one of these Russian researchers of the 19th century. He reports that if a Kazakh man converted to Christianity, his relatives would take away all his property. In general, initially, the notion of measure for measure existed in nomadic society. If a person killed another, then the same waited for him. If he beat someone, then accordingly, he was also beaten. Gradually, they abandoned this practice, retaining only the penalty for murder. But here, an alternative to the death sentence. Such a concept was introduced as kun, property, remuneration, compensation. By paying a kun, even a murderer, with the consent of the injured party, could save his life. The size of the kun depended on the social identity of the perpetrator and the victim. As is known, the Kazakh society was feudal at that time, and accordingly there was a division between ordinary people and nobility. If, for example, a simple person was killed, we emphasize a man because... After all, it was a patriarchal society. The ransom consisted of a thousand sheep. A thousand sheep for modern money is probably around a thousand or two thousand dollars. If suppose such a thing happened that some sultan or some nobleman were killed, then the ransom was increased immediately by seven times. That is, the ransom consisted of seven thousand sheep. This inequality extended including to gender. Even if a noble woman was killed, the mother of some sultan, of course, it was a scandal, but the amount of the ransom was halved. That is, up to three and a half thousand sheep for the representative of the nobleman and 500 sheep for the representative of the commoner. Over time, the Kun infiltrated almost all areas of justice of the nomads. Only crimes related to violence against women remained without change. So according to the Code of Nomads, for seducing an unmarried woman, a man had to marry her. Otherwise, no one would envy his fate. What can we say about those who seduce the married stepwoman? Kazakh society, like any society, had its exceptions to the rules, and such precedents happened when the kun was not paid, the person was not executed, but alternative forms of punishment were used. In 1736, in Kazakhstan, there was such an English man. His name was Kasli. He was at Han's headquarters, and he told in his notes that once a nobleman had come to him with a request, and he asked Kasli to stop the bleeding in some way because he was very close with the wife of one of the Khans. Accordingly, he was castrated. Of course, the operation wasn't held in the best medical conditions. There was bleeding, and this doctor treated him. In general, as noted by researchers of the Code of Nomads, family law and the right of inheritance did not receive a decent development in Jati Jarge. This is probably due to the fact that many relationships within families and clans were governed by the customary law of Adat and were generally known, and therefore Jati Jarge only partially concerned them. 
We cannot say that women were so powerless. In fact, the woman did not participate in the legal proceedings. She could be the object of being tried, executed, and so on. But nevertheless, as the mother of the family, she, moreover, let's say, even before this, the ancient authors wrote that everything can be achieved with the Turks through a woman. There was an episode from the history of the Turkic Kaganat in the 6th, 7th century. There was one case where there was a struggle for the throne for power and one of the applicants was removed for reason. And the reason was low origin of the mother. At the same time, it is worth noting that the possession of women in the Turkic world was quite high. For example, the Khans received foreign ambassadors always in the presence of their wives. It is also known that the wives of the Khan of the Golden Horde, Uzbek, stood on the right and left sides of the Khan during the Great Court Ceremony. In the modern world, in many countries, there are children's colonies. Criminal liability comes from 14 years. But what about child crime in ancient times? Children were not considered as an object of harsh punishment. This issue had been resolved in the family. In any case, there are no cases of children being executed. After all, the child was regarded as Erke. Erke means mischievous child. Initially, among the nomads, they taught their children to listen to the adults. They taught them not to violate rules. There is such a concept in the Kazakh language as Uyat. They say all the time, Uyad Bulari, it will be a shame. In some cases, it was enough for the child not to perform such actions. These are the rules in which the child grew up. Initially, there was a process of socialization, familiarization with society. Naturally, children at all times were children. They played pranks, fought, and could drag off something from the next yurt. When a father or grandfather found out about this, the tomboy was waiting for a spanking. After the punishment, the adults explained to the child his offense dishonored not only himself, but also his father, mother, and the whole race. Such an approach to the upbringing of children, as a result, yielded its fruits. People before committing a crime understood that they not only put their lives at risk, but also put their whole family in an uncomfortable position. And we understand that then the Kazakh society was very generic. Then the family stood in the foreground and it worked as a certain preventive measure. So it was not only about the fact that you disgrace yourself, but you disgrace your kind. Why? Because there were such situations when there was a crop failure, the livestock died out and the family could not pay for this crime. And then the shame in public censor extended to the whole family. Because people said that they were a family of criminals, that they could not be responsible for his actions. As for foreigners who committed crimes in the territory of nomads, they were judged by the same laws as the indigenous people. There were no such concept as extradition, exchange or issuance. The court of the bees on the Jeti Jargi existed until the beginning of the 19th century. Already by 1867, the Kazakhs began to see changes in the judicial system. In Kazakhstan, the law and the court of the Russian Empire were introduced, although partly the customary law and the B court remained in force, which were limited and adapted to the new criminal system. In the 19th century, the Russian governance system was introduced in the steppe governorship, and accordingly, the general Russian court, which was no longer connected with the bees, was introduced gradually. These were the reforms of 1822. This is primarily the abolition of the Kant's power. And then there was the reform of 1868. This judicial system will go down in history under the name of temporary situation. According to it, new judicial authorities, military judicial commissions, and district judges were established. Along with these bodies, the B courts continued to function in the owls. 
However, under the new provision, major criminal cases were considered by military courts. They were tried under military laws for such crimes as treason, resisting the authorities, killing officials, attacking public transport, mail, damage to the telegraph, and under the general criminal laws of the empire for murder, robbery, assault on merchant caravans, and arson. The process was phased long enough. First reforms were introduced in 1822-1824. Reforms of the statute on Siberian Kyrgyz charters on the Orenburg Kyrgyz. Then they made a lot of changes and additions. Then in the 60s, there were new positions, later back in the 90s, but in general, there was such a tendency that at first the Russian authorities almost completely left the right in the area in the hands of the Kazakhs themselves. That is, the Kazakhs themselves should judge their people. Then they introduce changes in stages. For example, the imperial court will investigate the most serious crimes, such as murder and robbery. There were royal courts. Kazakhs dealt with civil cases, not for large sums. That is, the majority of the the proceedings were left to the Kazakhs, but if it was a serious matter, then this was again decided by the royal court. Then slowly the scope of the Kazakh courts decreased, the area of authority of the royal courts increased, and so it continued. <laughs> According to the reforms of 1867-1868, in each volast, from four to eight bees were elected and approved by the military governor. Bees dealt with a case individually on the basis of customary law in force in the steppe. The decision of the bee court enforced the parish ruler. There was also a volast congress of bees. Its function included the analysis of claims for up to 500 rubles, which is equivalent to 25 horses or 250 sheep. In addition, dissatisfied with the verdict of bees in matters of marriage and family, could complain to the county chief, who decided the case on his own. Well, but in a number of cases, by the way, the Kazakhs preferred the Russian system because in a number of cases it saved them from some punishment systems. But this concerned the poorest sections of the population. This concerned women, by the way. Let's say the girl did not want to marry someone, but she was forced, and the Russian court decided that it was impossible. In this case, for some girls, this was a salvation. Under the new judicial system, the Kazakhs were allowed to apply directly to the Russian court by passing the B Corps. Also, corporal punishment and the death penalty were abolished. Prisons began to appear in the cities. However, despite such changes in the judicial system, the nomads still, along with the Russian imperial court, had every right to appeal to the B. The solution of controversial issues preserved an alternative to do everything according to the new law or to address a B and solve it according to the laws of the ancestors. After the arrival of the Bolsheviks, a lot of things have changed. That is, if in Tsarist time there was still some local flavor, the rulers of customary law were still valid for some cases, but the Bolsheviks said that the same laws would operate everywhere. A new era of lawmaking has begun, but this is a completely different story. As for the notions of the nomads, as wild tribes who did not know the law and justice, it is obvious that this is only the ignorance of the narrators of the fear of the militant nomads. All historians agree on one thing. A century ago, in the expanses of the Great Steppe, there was a very low crime rate, thanks to the strict adherence to the Adat, Jeti, Jargi, and proper upbringing. It is important to understand that criminality does not characterize any people from the positive side. 
Perhaps we need to follow the example of our ancestors and bring up our children honest, decent, and fair. Perhaps then, like hundreds of years ago, we will be able to reduce crime and our descendants will live in a safe country. My name is Andres Lojan. It was the Time Puzzle. See ya.